Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Are we ready for an uh, blessed and wonderful afternoon after that uh, long lunch? I think we're ready, right? We're not sleepy, right? I can see some faces. Oh, Javier is already up. I saw he was, he was sleeping there. All right, so we're going to start our AY program. So as we said yesterday, yeah, we, yesterday was introduction of the program of today, or the, this weekend's program, and uh, we'll be having continuation of the discussions we, we had yesterday. So some of the questions that you had yesterday, if you wrote your questions, I think during the program we'll be collecting or we'll be asking you to, to ask your questions, and then your questions will be answered along the program. So let's pray before we start singing. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for everything you have done for us. Thank you for this moment that we have come as we start our Hayway program. We want to ask once again, O oh Father, that as we sing, we may sing our songs of worship and praises, O oh Father. And may this worship be only about Christ, O oh Father. Help us to pull self aside and we may worship you in truth and in spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing a couple of songs, but the first song I want, or oh, the first songs I want to get suggestion from you guys. So tell me your favorite song and then we're going to sing as a congregation. Who will be the first one? A short chorus, a hymnal song, whatever. We're going to sing. If we, don't, if we don't know, we will learn. So who's the courageous one, the courageous one in, that will suggest the first song? We are marching to Zion. Marching to Zion. Uh, does anyone has the gift of playing piano? <laughs> the skills or the gift? Yes. Thank you. Amen? Yes. Whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God, right? Marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord. Blessing. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. The songs we sing accord, join in the song. Sweet accord and us around the throne and thus surround the throne. We march in Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we march in upward to Zion, the beautiful city. The lady, second stanza. Ladies. Louder. Marching to Zion. We march to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We march upward to Zion, the beautiful city of gentlemen. All right, come on now. We march 
hymnal songs we sing short chorus and uh, you know those songs that are more lively because not all the hymnal songs are for AY and it's I like when it's AY in the African congregation and Nicola is around you know why I like it I can answer my who, who knows why I like it when Nicola is around you don't know Nicola People ask him, it's Nicola. You want to know it's Nicola? Yes. You want to know? If you know, you answer this song. Sia Libonga. Nicola, please join me. You know, let's, uh, let's go a little bit to Africa. In uh, Zimbabwe. Yes. For a while, we're going to Zimbabwe. And we're gonna sing Sia Libongo. So we don't know the lyrics. We just sing whatever she will sing. <laughs> just answer. Just answer whatever she will tell you to answer. What shall we do? What shall we do? but they don't know. <laughs> okay. You just sing like Yebo Sia Libonga Loni Gazi Lembana Beloved, come and come make the bass. This song is beautiful when there's bass. Did we get it? You got it? No. <laughs> One more. Okay, we'll try it again. You know, right? Yes. <laughs> Providence, you know the song? Yes, she knows. Uncle Trust. I know you know the song. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, trust. Uh, you know, we trust you. I, su I, I sang with trust in Testify. It's a good bass. Yes. <laughs> he retired. He retired. Yeah. You will see the bass from Zimbabwe. Okay, I need to send you. Okay, so. Once again. Okay, uh, we'll sing once again then so that you get the words. I don't know. I think it's going to be hard, but we'll just try. See you. 
then you follow. Like this. Let's try it now. See I voices now, right? You know, if you want to learn more songs like this, join the African camp this year. You, that, that's where we learn this song, huh? With Pastor Mpiri. It's, it's, that, that's, that's how we say this name, right? Andrew. Yeah. If you want to know more, more, songs, more songs like this, uh, you join the African camp. December, December 26, right? We are living on the 26, right? Huh? From 26 to 31. We are living, yes. So don't miss that. Don't miss. Yes. So let's continue singing. Okay, I said we're going to sing one more song from the congregation. Oh, we want. Okay. Oh, yes. Rwandese. We want to learn one song from Rwanda, right? One song from one A Y song from Rwanda. You want to learn? Yes. Who can teach us? Alice. Alin, yes. Okay, they, they, they are preparing. They are getting ready. You want to learn one from Angola, right? I think we learned already. Huh? We, we learned one last time, right? Do you remember? Uh, we, uh, last time we sang There's one more in Portuguese. A Y song. Pass Elias. A Y song. What songs? Who is fresh? So Vesel is fresh. Just came from Angola. Dallas, the youth, the, the youth leader, A.Y. Song from Angola. Huh? A.Y. Song. Huh? No songs. I'm thinking. No. 
Ok. country we uh, Angola Kenya one from Kenya yes is uh, okay Paselias we found one Paselias please come it will teach us one one in Portuguese that's one of the songs we sing during AY in Angola uh, good afternoon now today we are going back to Angola now the song it goes like this. Ewire, only Deus me manda no final, my shandy deva sail. Will you be able to sing with me? Eu, let, let's, let's, please repeat after me. Eu, irei, only Deus me manda no final. That means I shall go where. God sent me, something like that. Now, um, let me call on my good friend, Pastor Lutero, because he knows about the song. Um, he, is, he, he says he's, he's eating a lot, but it goes like this. Ewi rei, oni deus mi manda nu final, ma shani rei a seu. Ewi rei, oni deus mi manda nu final, ma shani rei a seu. Ewi rei, i rei, eu irei, en si awe terra santa, eu irei. Can somebody help me? Dala, can you come and help me? Eu irei, i rei, eu irei, en si awe. By the way, we march. En si awe, a terra santa, eu irei. Can we stand? We, we, we usually march. We usually march. Huh? Okay. Um, this is AY, right? Okay, let's go. Hey. Everyone, everyone, please. Vanessa, can you stand? Okay. Um, he says we go part. Um, okay, little by little. Hey, we only. Ewi rei, oni Deus mi manda nu final. Can you repeat? Ewi rei, oni Deus mi manda nu final. Marchando. Shandi rei a se. Again. Ewi rei, oni Deus mi manda. Follow him. Final. Marchando. Marchandi rei a se. Can we try it? Ewi rei, oni Deus mi manda nu final. Marchandi rei a seu again. Eu irei onde Deus me manda no final. Marchando. Marchandi rei a seu. Eu irei. Eu irei. 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 Eu irei em Sião e Terra Santa. Eu irei. Again eu irei. Eu irei. Irei. Eu irei. He said the key is high. Let's go down. Could you? Okay. Go, go ahead, go, go. Can we try to act this? Um. <laughs> yeah, matching. We, 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 we have to match like this. Matching. Every day, on the day you man a new final. March and the day I say. Can you match? Every day, on the day you man a new final. Mas chandire a seu mais. Eu irei, eu irei, irei, eu irei. Ensinam a terra santa. Eu irei. If you are a white is mais. Irei, eu irei. Ensinam a terra santa. Eu irei, eu irei, eu irei. 
Pondi Deus me manda no final Mas irei a ser mais, mais Eu irei Onde Deus me manda no final Mas irei a ser Eu irei, irei Eu irei Em Sião é terra santa Eu irei Now, that, there's the last part who we'll asked this group to call, this group will call, Eu irei. You guys say, hey, 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 hey. Are we together? Are we together? So, I'll sing with them, then Dala will sing with you. Are we together? Okay, let's do it. Eu irei. Hey, 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 hey. Eu irei. one of the songs we sing in AY, in Angola. So we, w we will learn from Rwanda. You're still preparing, right? Aline? They're, they're getting ready. But for now, let's start our program. Let's stand. And, uh, and we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Let's stand to start our program and sing Victory in Jesus. Okay, let's, let's stand. Uh, I had an old, old story. Let's sing. I had an old, old story of a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a rest like me. I had a Plan 
Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of Sabbath. And we thank you, Father, to guide us to this program. Please, Father, send the Holy Spirit to be with us as we start this program. And please, take away any distraction that may put us aside to listen to your word. Father, we thank you for all the blessings we had, and we ask for forgiveness if we have committed something against thee. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Thank you very much for staying. Um, we, we, have, we still have the papers behind at the back. Uh, you can have them and write your prayer requests. You write your comments. Or you can also write uh, your questions if you have any. Um, I just want to say uh, welcome, welcome once again to this afternoon program. And we are still worshiping God, uh, so let's continue to have that spirit, that mind, that heart of learning and surrendering and deciding and taking um, serious decisions as each time we are learning from God. God bless you all, right? God bless you. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Okay. Uh, should be Dala. Dala and I will be singing a Portuguese song uh, entitled Estrada. Uh, 
in, <laughs> in English, yeah, The Road. Uh, it talks about, uh, actually it's a poem, it talks about the struggles that we face as a Christian. We, know, we all know that uh, we have a journey, we are in a journey, and there are many things in between, and uh, sometimes we are discouraged because of what we face, but because of faith and because of what we look forward, we have more than hope and we have more than strength to overcome the, the struggle that we see. And yeah, that's it. Sorri, eu me promessas 
Teu das promessas de uma canção. Irei morar com eiras dessa velha estrada, não podem ofuscar a cruz que escolhi seguir e proclamar, proclamar, pois a minha fé está mais alto. Que qualquer obstáculo, todos os saltos, baixos e altos, eu vencerei. E eu almejo estar ali daqui.
My Jesus loves me, yes, I know. He loves me, yes, I know. He touched my life when I was lost. He touched me, yes, I know. Jesus, my sins away he was nailed on the cross and bestowed me victory in Jesus now I'm free the Lord has promised good to me his word my hope secure My sins away, he was there on the cross and bestowed me victory in Jesus. Now I'm free. I was, was lost, but now. Amen. Have you noticed they take long to sing, but when they sing, you want them to take longer. They always, they don't start right away. They never do. <laughs> but you don't want them to end after they've started. Thank you so much. Um, there's something I want to read before we talk a little. Is this from Desire of Ages? page 92, paragraph 2. She says, Yet through childhood, youth, and manhood, Jesus walked alone. Though he was alone, he walked it in purity, in faithfulness, and then she repeats again, alone. And then she says, none was with him. It's practically the same thing as alone. So look, three times. He carried the awful weight of responsibility for the salvation of men. He knew that unless there was a decided change to principles, to the principles and purposes of the human race, all would be lost. He carried out the design of his life. He himself should be the light of men. And you know, Jesus has risen, Jesus has resurrected. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this, If Jesus has not risen, our gospel is in vain. Not only does he say that, then he says, We are to be the most pitied. Why? Because we've put our whole trust in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So if Jesus didn't resurrect, then we are in big trouble, according to Paul. The good news is that he has risen. That's the awesome news. And then Paul in Romans 8. This is why Paul says, I am convinced that neither angels, nor demons, nor height, nor depth, nor anything to come, nor anything present, shall separate me from the love of God. There's this assurance in Jesus Christ that you find in no other place. You can find it in no other place in this world except in Jesus. Um, 
Christ. It's been four years of ministry. And we are happy. We are excited. I don't have the right words. But God has been so faithful. Um, we've traveled. So many people have been baptized. And I think that's what gives um, a lot of joy when you do serve God. When you see people giving their lives to Christ and when you see people's life transformed. But I find it interesting that actually um, the transformation starts first with us. And it's been a blessing. And those of you that are involved in ministry, we would like to encourage you to continue. Those of you that are not, please do. It is a blessing for you, and it is also a blessing for those um, around you. God has given everyone gifts and talents, and God expects us to use them. He will not give you something that he cannot enable you to use, and he cannot give you the opportunity to use. When you do not use them, you are depriving yourself of spiritual growth, and you're depriving yourself of an intimate relationship with God that only comes when you walk with him and so I want to encourage all of you and I want to encourage myself um, to do that yesterday was also my birthday and I thank God and if you haven't had yet time to buy me a gift you still have time <laughs> I accept late gifts maybe some of you will receive your money at the end of the month I understand no problem um, at the end of the month, I, I can accept late gifts. Um, so, I, I, I'm waiting. Joshua, where's Joshua? Is he here? My friend, I'm waiting for what you promised. Since last year, I'm waiting. Happy Sabbath. This Sabbath has been a blessing for me. I don't want to preach. Um... I want us to read our Bibles for this afternoon. And then after this, there will be two songs. And then there were some questions that were raised um, on the things that were discussed yesterday. And maybe some of you have questions concerning the sermon. If the Lord gives us grace to answer them, we will answer them. The questions we cannot answer them, we will go and research and come back with an answer. Amen? Okay, so that's what we will do. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? Let us, you can put it up. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for everything you've been doing. Please have mercy upon us and help us to focus. Help me not to preach but to discuss. May we have a discussion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hmm. If you have your Bibles, I want to take you to Genesis. Just go to Genesis. No chapter yet. Um, first we'll begin with a poem. Uh, there's, there's this pastor, there's this evangelist who has a quotation. Favorite quotation from the writings of Ellen White. And that's not the one I want to show you. That's what he wants to show us. <laughs> and his favorite quotation from Ellen White goes like this. It's Southern Watchmen. There is no limit. Pastor Elias will continue. And those of you who know, there is no limit to the usefulness of the one who put himself aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to? To? That's Pastor Koto's favorite quotation. He would make people memorize it. And I'm happy I memorized it. There is no limit to the usefulness of the one who putting self what? Who putting self aside makes room for the working of the Spirit. There's no limit to the usefulness. Huh? But for that to be possible, self must be put aside. 
Budisai is writing a book. Um, we, Ahija Ministry, we've been mainly through videos, through media, week of prayer, uh, weekend seminars, but we have decided to go into writing. Um, Trust is working on a book. And I think it's 70% now. There are editors who are also going to check it. And soon we're looking for publisher. The book <laughs> is amazing. It's on media ministry. It's really good. And it will be out soon. Um, I'm also writing poems. And I'm working on a book. And I'm going to read one of the poems. I've published three of them. I've written ten. Um, we're also going into comics. As Sono is drawing, he actually did this drawing. This is a drawing for one of the poems I wrote. I just explained to him the poem, and he put it into picture, which is a, a wonderful um, ability. Um, what else? What else? What else? So we're now going into writing, and we need your prayers. I am done with my poems, but we're looking for a publisher. Um, the design is being made by one of the new members in the Hijra ministry, Johnny. He has master guide, so he's not around. Um, so please keep us in prayer. And um, if the Lord blesses you, remember us. Remember us. We want to serve God and we want to use every means to reach out to people. So the title of this poem is Pride. And this is how it goes. It's connected with what we will discuss and it's connected with incorruptible. Beautified and surrounded with roses, unnoticed force behind choices, altering thoughts and voices. It's a lamb with a lion's heart, initiating fire without a spark, so attractively dark, conceived in our heart, producing devastating art, it's Lucifer's paint brush, a sinner's crush. We nipple on this thorn, all come with it as they are born. All go with it as we mourn. Thank you. All go with it as we mourn, causes us much scorn, leaves us torn without human form. Won't lead us far except to war, yet the world chants for more. No woman is so seductive, no drug so addictive, no other so vindictive. Who shall deliver us from the love of our life, our secret wife, gently slicing us apart like a knife? Only Christ, only Christ. Come, and if you must, then run. He restores genuine fun. In us, it can no longer hide, for the Spirit is now our guide. In us, may He daily abide, for we chant the death of pride. It comes to us all, it's the reason behind mine and your fall. This is why snakes crawl. And only Jesus can help us stand tall. Pride blinds the eye. Some don't even know it's the reason why they cry. My prayer is that God may continually humble us all. May God's mercy and grace be upon us to be continued. So the poem, there's a poem and then there's an explanation of the poem. But the poem talks about pride and how self separates us from God, and limits the work of God within us. I would like to take you to Genesis. And I'm going to ask you to read um, the verses that we are going to read. And for the first chapter, let me find it. I was in Exodus. Genesis chapter... Um, chapter what? Chapter 25. Genesis 25. 25. No, 26. Genesis 26. Sorry. Genesis 26. So I'm going to ask somebody to read, to stand up and read... Um, Verse 12, verse 12. Somebody from the congregation to please stand up and read verse 12. 
anybody? Who can read verse 12 for us? Yes, please, as loud as you can. Thank you very much. He planted, and in that same year, he reaped, he reaped a hundredfold. Can someone read verse 13? 13. Anybody? A different person. Verse 13. Great. So he, he planted in one year, and in that year he reaped a hundredfold. And then the Bible says he continued to grow. Look at verse 14. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so that the Philistines did what? The Philistines did what? They envied him. The Bible says, if you look very carefully, it says he planted, he reaped, and then it says he continued to grow in wealth, um, and in so many other things in position. Now I want to read to you verse 16. The first time I read this, I laughed. I couldn't believe that this is what I was reading. Verse 16 says, Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. Don't stay here. There was a famine where he was. So he went... Um, to Gerar because there was no famine there. So when he arrives there, they give him a land. And then he plants. And in that same year that he plants, he's immediately um, successful. Now the secret of his success was that God was with him. And everything he did um, prospered. This was Isaac. They said to him, leave because you are too powerful for us. I want you to go to Genesis 30. Genesis 30. Genesis 30, verse 27. Someone else. We're collecting a verse, and I hope you get the trend. There's a trend here. This is now um, Jacob. This is no longer Isaac. This is Jacob, Genesis 30, verse 27. Somebody please. Somebody, please. There we go. As loud as you can, please. Thank you. Yesterday, Sima and Amira shared a verse that says we should be an example. You have seen this morning that Jesus was an example in all spheres of life, mentally, I mean physically, socially, spiritually. Jesus was an incorruptible example for society. And this was notable wherever he was placed. Wherever Jesus was placed, he was successful. And through his lifestyle, um, his presence drew others um, to God. There is something God does when God gives you a mission, God gives you fame. The Bible says that people came from all over to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. The Bible says that people came all over to listen to Jesus. And there are so many other examples. Now, this fame is to point people to Jesus. I'll give you one example. Hezekiah. They came to visit him in his palace. When they came to him, what did Hezekiah do? He said, you see that gold? It's mine. You see what I've accomplished? You see all of this? You see all of that? You see this and this and this and this? All of this? This is mine. Then the Lord came to him through the prophet and said, Because you have done this, you did not tell them about me. I didn't give you fame to glorify you. It was so that you can draw people to God. And so he received his punishment. There are people who say, I just want to be a simple Christian. There's no such thing. Unless when you say simple, you mean humble. Are you with me? Hello? Nobody has the presence of God 
and remains unnoticed in a community. Hello? Hello? Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 says that Jesus saw the disciples coming. After he saw the disciples coming, verse 1 says he went up on the mountain. And after the disciples came to him, he sat down, verse 2, he began speaking to them. Blessed are the what? The poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you on account of me, for so did they persecute the prophets before you. And then Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Neither does a man light a candle and put it under a table, but it is placed on top. Jesus says, we are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Jesus wants us and created us to reflect his glory and to testify about him. We are not really the light of the world. It is Jesus who is actually the light of the world. But as we interact with him, we receive of that light and we reflect that light. And so you see in the life of, uh, for example, Isaac, he went to a land and they said, you are too powerful, you need to leave. He planted on that year and he reaped a hundredfold. Then you have Isaac. Laban said, I have noticed that I am blessed and my family is blessed on account of you. Your presence in my house has caused my business to succeed. I have noticed that. If you look at verse 30, no, verse 21, no, verse 28, sorry. He continued, name me your wages and I will give it. But he said to him, you yourself know how I served you and how you, your cattle have fared with me, verse 30. For you had little, you had little before I came. And it has increased to a what? Hello? It has increased to a multitude. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turn. But now, when shall I provide for my own household? So he tells him, God has blessed you on account of me. And even Laban himself recognizes and says, my house has been blessed um, on account of you. From Isaac Jacob... I want you to take your Bibles and proceed to Joseph. Um, and I want you to go to chapter 39 of Genesis. Chapter 39. I, wanna, I just want to ask you to read some verses. Chapter 39. Chapter 39. Incorruptible against all odds. Chapter 39. Now, if you know the story of Joseph, his father had 12 children. Joseph was one of them. And he was the what? He was the youngest, right? Joseph's brothers were against him. Isn't that correct? But Joseph in his house had a 10-star treatment. He had special garment made for him. He ate whatever he requested. He was the favorite. After this, he was sold into what? Slavery. Now think of this. The person who is being sold into slavery is someone who is coming from a home where he is treated like a king. Okay? Keep that in mind. He is treated like a king. One day, he becomes a slave immediately. He's tied. He doesn't receive that treatment he was receiving anymore. On top of that, Ellen White mentions his age. I think it's either 17 or 18, one of those two, when he was taken away. Very young. He was living like a king in his father's house. He did nothing. Okay, he was always sharing his dreams. Be careful. Sometimes you shouldn't share your dream with people. Just keep it to yourself and pray. <laughs> yeah, sometimes just pray and do what the Lord tells you. So he's taken away, okay? 
And he's being taken to a land he doesn't know. He's a young boy. He's always been with his father. Amazing treatment, amazing care. He becomes a slave immediately. Ellen White says that his heart was broken. But as he was departing, he remembered his father used to tell him about God. So Ellen White said, he said he purposed in his heart and said this. I will be faithful to that God regardless of what I face. Then he goes. Now I want you to read somebody very quickly. I want you to read verse 2. Verse 2. Please, as loud as possible. Okay. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of the master of the Egyptians. Thank you. The Lord was with Joseph. Because the Lord was with Joseph, he was a successful? He was a successful? Man. When he was taken, he was taken as a slave. He was taken by the slave master. And now I, I will read verse 3. Now his master saw, his master who was pagan, not a Jew, saw that the Lord was with. When the Lord touches an individual, you cannot keep them underground. Every Christian should be like this if we have the Holy Spirit. How the Lord caused all that, all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4. So Joseph found favor in the sight and became a personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house and all that he owned. Joseph is a foreigner. This guy makes him, puts him in charge of everything he owns. Not normal. But we had a problem. I won't read this part. Joseph's um, master's wife fell in love with him. The Bible says that Joseph was very handsome. Now listen to me. You, the Bible doesn't always mention that someone is handsome. How many times you read the Bible and it says, and it pauses, so, this so-and-so was handsome. This brother was not a joke. He was the type of brother who walked in and some guys would even look. <laughs> he was handsome. And she wanted to sleep with him. And <laughs> if he denies, she can do something and he will go to jail. Are you with me? Are you with me? He's under pressure here. And it's easy. She likes him. He can just sleep with her. The master has placed everything in his charge. He can tell the guards to leave. He can arrange things. The master will never know. The master will never know. So she pressed him and pressed him and pressed him and pressed him. Um, Elder Cleveland said, um, what did he say? He said that Joseph put on his Air Jordans and ran out of there. He was under pressure. I want to tell you what Joseph said. Joseph said this. He said this. My master has in charge all of this to me. This is very strange. My master has in charge all of this to me. First thought. How can I do this against God? Are you with me? When he says, my master has given me all of this, he's not saying, I am not going to do this because of my master who's been good to me. My master has been good to me and set me in charge. How can I do this thing against God? How can I do this thing against God? His relationship with God, he... <laughs> you see, this is why the world and countries where atheism is prosperous... There's a problem of morality. When truth is relative and there is no absolute, I can do whatever I want to and there's no one I'm accountable to or I respond to. Joseph said, how can I do this against God? Because there is a God, I am a creature, I am accountable, there is a law, this law is the moral law, it says thou shalt not commit adultery, this law is above me. I, I cannot break this law. It is my point of reference, so I cannot venture into that. And he doesn't go there. And that's how he survived. Now, there are consequences. He's thrown in prison. Some would say, man, I just stood for you, Lord, and you let me go in prison. First of all, I'm taken from my father's house. I'm a slave. I didn't complain. I just did the work of a slave. 
Now, I am in prison for being faithful. When he went to prison, he, he, he worked so well. You know what the Bible says? I won't read. Even in the prison, they noticed that God was with him, so they put him in charge of the prisoners. You see, the, ungo the godly, it doesn't matter where you put um, the godly. Wherever you put them, they flourish. And the Bible says because God was with him in the prison. And then God arranges for him to get out. He causes vi dreams and vision and then he gets out. Um, but only after two years, he was in prison for two years. And then he gets out, he interprets the dream. And then the Bible says he was made, he was put in charge of everything in Egypt. And the king said, after, you will be equal to me. Now listen to this. Joseph, let's look at the context, the background. Joseph is in Egypt. Joseph is not an Egyptian. Joseph is a Jew. He's made king in Egypt. It's like um, Fernando is made king in the Philippines. From Equatorial Guinea. They know this is an Israelite. They know he doesn't live here. They know he's not a, from our people. They know all of that, but they said there's no one greater in this land than him. After Joseph interpreted the dream, he told the king there's going to be a famine. Okay? A severe famine. Uh, seven years of prosperity and then seven years of famine. He was not suggesting himself. He said to the king, I won't read, uh, you need to find someone who is wise enough to handle all of this and prepare for that famine. Do that. And then, he, okay, now I'm leaving. My job is to interpret. You know what the Bible says? The king said, guys, he said this. Do you know anyone apart from him who has this? He said, come back. Come back. You are going to lead this nation. You are going to lead this nation. Jesus said, the secrets of the kingdom have been revealed to you but to others it comes in the form of parables that they may hear and not understand, they may see and not perceive. There are truths. There are truths that God has only entrusted to spiritual Israel, and it's our job to take it to the world. They don't know sanctuary. They don't want really understand state of the dead unless we break it down. They don't really understand the Sabbath clearly. The secrets of the kingdom have been revealed to you. You see here, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Wherever Joseph was placed, he was successful. And one of the things I love about this, the Bible says that people from all nations, last verse of the chapter, on the earth came to Egypt because there was no food. The famine was global. I love it because Egypt is in Africa. Allow me to enjoy this. I have to enjoy this. Um, I just have to enjoy it. It was there. And by the way, this is also where Jesus learned how to walk and talk. Do you know why? There was a time the angel told Jesus, Mary, and Joseph and Mary to take Jesus and flee because they wanted to kill Jesus. Where did they run to? They stayed there for three years. Unless Jesus was not a normal baby, he learned only how to walk and talk after three years. Because if within three years he could walk and talk, he learned how to walk and talk in Egypt. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless Africa. <laughs> now, you see that wherever Joseph was, he was successful, but Joseph always gave the credit to God. He was incorruptible, not because of him, but because God was with him. Jesus is the one who is incorruptible. Two more people, very quickly. We've looked at Joseph. I want to take you to the book of Daniel. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. The book of Daniel. I have a feeling I left someone, but it's okay. And Daniel, what verse shall we read? Okay, verse 6. Verse 6, verse 6, verse 6. 3, verse 3 says this. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed a what? What does your Bible say? Why was he distinguishing himself amongst everyone in Babylon? Because he had what? What did he have, brethren? 
He had an excellent, in other words, he had the holy. Daniel was in Babylon. Daniel was, excuse me, offered food that was um, offered to the idols. And it was a sin to eat that. So he rejected. The consequence is we are going, you, will, you might be punished if you are not healthier. Do you know what Daniel said? Give us 10 days. Give us 10 days. He had so much faith that God would do a miracle. God did the miracle. There was another time his three friends bowed down to this image. If you don't, we will barbecue you. The fire was hot. There were other Israelites there. All the Israelites bowed down. And that includes the elders. There were probably priests there. Okay? That bowed down. These three young men did not bow down. You know what the king did? The king said, because the king loved them. The Bible says they were wiser than all the astrologers, magicians, and all the wise men that were in Babylon. And they knew even the lit literature of Babylon better than those who were from Babylon. They knew the wisdom of Babylon more than those who were of Babylon. Okay? So they tell them, bow down. And the king liked them, so they told the king, listen, those guys, those three guys don't want to bow down. So the king said, listen guys, I heard you don't want to bow down. You guys are good guys. I like you guys. And you're helping the kingdom. I'm going to give you a second chance. If you read the background and the history, the convoys of Nebuchadnezzar, he was a wicked king. This was not a person who gives second chances. I will give you a second chance. You see the music? They are going to play the music again. This time when you hear the music, we want you to bow down. Ah, 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 king, king, don't finish your sentence. We love you, king. We respect you, king. Listen, king, we want you to understand something. We don't need more time. You don't need to play the music again, okay? Um, if you throw us in this den, in this furnace, and we burn... King, we want you to understand something. You see, if we burn in there, it's not because our God is not faithful. Okay? If we burn in there, our God is still faithful. So you are going to throw us, because we are not going to bow down. Let's not talk about that. Don't give us time. Don't play the music again. You just go ahead and throw us there. But know this. Know this. If we die, God is good. And if we live, God is also good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. They were thrown there. Jesus joined them there. And Jesus kept them there. And you come to this verse, it says that they were successful because they had an excellent spirit within them. Daniel was not a Babylonian. Daniel was a Jew. But Daniel in Babylon had the highest position after Nebuchadnezzar. All the other Babylonians, they did not have his position. Nothing was done without Daniel's consent. They had to go and consult from Daniel. Why? Because the Spirit of God was upon him. And you see the Bible says Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and in favor with men. We are, let me now say, supposed to be the light of the world. And the verse that was read on Friday says we ought to be a good example to the world. We ought to be leading people to God. But unfortunately, we haven't been doing that. That doesn't mean, I don't like it when people say there's no revival in the church. That's not true. There's no revival in some places. There are places where there are revivals. And there are people who are experiencing revival. Not everyone may be experiencing revival. But we ought to be doing better with the light that we have received from God. There are certain things we must not be doing anymore. There are certain things that we ought not to be struggling with anymore. We ought to be the light of the world. But that only happens, as you have seen, in all of these verses, there's more... They were with God. God was with them. So it didn't matter if they were in prison. 
if they were slaves, whether they were in a palace, whether they were somewhere else, wherever they were, they testified of God and they led people to God. They were incorruptible because they had a living relationship with the incorruptible God. This journey is not an easy journey. It needs daily prayer and daily devotion. Jesus on earth had to do that, how much more me and you. And so this afternoon, I want to leave this with you. And I would like to encourage you, I have been encouraged reading, contemplating, and thinking about this throughout the week, and even at this moment, as I share this with you. And as I look at um, how God has been blessing us, I'm talking about a hijab ministry, as we have been serving, um, God has been faithful. Without God, without God, it's in vain. There's something Joseph said the other Saturday. Joseph, what did you say about eternity? Eternity. In the AY. In the AY. Yeah, you can read. You don't remember, huh? Can you read? Can you read? say it? You posted it on Facebook. Nobody remembers his post? Yes, what is not eternal is eternally useless. What is not eternal is eternally useless. I don't know how else to express this, but we need God. And we do not go to God for blessing, we go to God for Him. We go to God to have communion with Him. Without that, <laughs> without that, anything else um, is vanity and it is useless. And once you have God, don't worry about the future. Worry about doing what he expects from you. God does not ask us to do what is humanly impossible. He asks us to do what is humanly possible. What is not possible, we must leave that to him. A practical example. I met two girls yesterday night over here. I was having a walk here yesterday night. We have an exam and uh, we, two, two, two exams every day for, 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 for four days. And we, 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 it's so much. And we also have final exam. We have midterm exam. Midterm qualifying exam. I said, okay. What God expects us to do in this situation is study. It's study. The Holy Spirit doesn't cheat. You don't study Holy Spirit help me. Help you what? <laughs> to tell you what? To tell you what? The Holy Spirit can help you remember. Okay? It can help you remember, not cheat. In this situation, what God expects from us is study, discipline, and rest. When we go for the exam, we pray and we let God do what only God can do. The day I used to do this, and this is why I'm telling you this. When I say I used to do this, meaning there were situations in life I tried to do what only God can do. You will exhaust yourself. Do what you are required to do from God. What you are not supposed to do, leave it to God. Don't worry about it. Just do what you have to do God does the impossible, we do the possible. I pray that we will see God daily and that we will stand incorruptible through Jesus Christ and we can make it to the very end and be saved. This is my prayer. Amen. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. We're going to sing a song in Portuguese. Sorry for those who speak English. But I believe the Spirit will help you to understand. Amen. Yeah, the songs, the songs speak about the second coming. Actually, it's a question that those who are waiting for Christ, those who are waiting for his second coming, are making. The song says, until when, God? Until when? We shall cry. Shall we wait for you? Until when? It's a prayer, and there is also a question. I hope as you listen to this song, may you please dwell on the on his coming because he's really coming. He's really coming and his coming is soon. You left your phone, man. All right, we'll now go into the last part, um, the question and answer time. Um, Budisai, please come. Um, you can project the questions.
Budisai, I think that's your question. All right. So we have two questions from yesterday, and that's a good thing. When there are a few questions, oh, three? Okay. It's either people didn't understand or... Uh -huh. <laughs> here, here, here. Uh, right. The question says, what do you do if you cheated but you feel guilty to the teacher? Or do you keep quiet and just ask God for forgiveness? That's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, let me see. First of all, I... I, I <laughs> We had a similar discussion uh, last night uh, about you're in a class and everybody else starts cheating and, and you, 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 you understand firm. And some of you actually gave a very uh, unchristian like answers, but it's all right. <laughs> we, 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 uh, we'll discuss. I'm going to read a text, though, uh, after, after I try and give my view of the question. I don't think I can give an absolute answer. I also want to hear from you what you, what you think about it. Um, first of all, as a, as a teacher, if you are going to, to, to cheat in my class, and then you... <laughs> well, if I find out that you have cheated in my class, then, wow, that's a problem. We, we have a problem with that. But then, uh, now, if you come back and admit, I'm talking personally, if you're going to come back to me and say, you know, say I actually cheated in your class and, you know, I feel bad about it. I pray to God for forgiveness, forgive me and all that. You know, come in, you're sincere. I, I would, uh, would find a way around it. Okay. I, I, <laughs> we, we would, uh, listen, uh, listen. Uh, that would also depend with the, were you a good student? I mean, maybe you're just having a failing test the whole semester and you also cheated at the end. And you're not serious. Well, it depends maybe the, uh, with the kind of person you are, with the student that you are, just on a practical level. And the relationship that I see with you, maybe you were, maybe you were a very committed student the whole semester. And then towards the end, I don't know what happened, maybe the devil got into you and you, you, you ended up cheating. We probably can uh, find a way around it. Maybe I, I would uh, for, forgive you and we find a way to... to, to uh, to move forward. But then, uh, speaking this as, as, as Christians, young, Christian young people or students, uh, I think the, the noblest thing to do first is you're feeling guilty because you know that it's the wrong thing to do that. And I'm sure even before you did it, you know, you don't just wake up and cheat. There's a process of cheating. You plan actually, you know, I should not get caught. I should make sure that, you know, my whatever I'm, I'm going to use to cheat there are means for doing that. You know, you need to gather some materials and you know, you need to you can't be caught. So, you have thought through the whole process. And uh, that, that takes uh, a lot of effort for you to do that. And when you, when you get to... When you get to cheat, and, well, and then after that you reflect and say, you know, I've, what I've done is not the best thing. I believe that as a, as a Christian, you, you, have, you feel guilty because you know that what you did is wrong. And the, the first thing to do is uh, you ask God for forgiveness for what you've done. That's how we live as Christians. You, you've fallen into sin and you've done something that is not right. Not just cheating in exams, but in every other aspect of our lives. In lying and all of that, whatever we do. Uh, ask God for forgiveness sincerely. And I do believe that when you do that, you talked about it earlier, when you, when you do ask God for forgiveness, he, you will know what you're supposed to do after that. Uh, you will know. Uh, I... You can have the conviction to say, you know what, something tells you I need to go back maybe and talk to the teacher and explain myself. But if you have prayed to God and you feel that God has forgiven you and you, 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 uh, you think you are right with that, uh, I don't know if, if you should go back to the teacher because sometimes if you go, uh, there are consequences for that. So you should be ready for that. God, as much as he's graceful, he's also just. There's justice and mercy. That's how God is, and that's what he actually expects from us. So knowing that you have committed sin, I also uh, really believe that there are consequences for everything that we do. We're living in a fallen universe right now because of uh, 
the consequences that we are now experiencing because of bad choice that were done by some people earlier on by our parents in the past. So that's why we're, that's why we're here today. So the consequences for, I mean, to both sides of this, if you are going to, to fall into this, in, into cheating. So my conclusion is that I don't advise you to, to cheat in your exam. I'm going to read one text here. I, I love this text. This is uh, in the first book of John, uh, first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 1. It says here, my little children, these things are right to you so that you will not sin. But, okay, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Uh, love the book of John. But the way he puts it, he understands that we live in a fallen universe. We, uh, we have trials and we can't run away from that. We've got trials and temptations and difficulties. But then he says that if you do get to sin, we have an advocate with the Father. In other words, there's a process. We know what we're supposed to do when we have fallen short. There are many stories in the Bible, the prodigal son, all of those, that show what, we, what to do when you're falling into sin. I think that's the way I will probably will tackle this question. It's kind of complicated. Uh, I hope you got something from it. I don't know if you guys want to say something about it uh, before we move to the next question. Uh, any other view or... Yes? I stole something from trust, I don't care. If it was just because I stole something or I cheated in the exam with the teacher, I don't care. But the fact that God comes in, that's why we feel guilty. So when we feel guilty, it's the fact that the Holy Spirit is drawing our attention on what we've done. So the first step is you go to God and ask for forgiveness. There are different types. When I cheat and I go back, God doesn't want us to end up in consequences. He never planned for us. When we ask God for forgiveness, this is my point of view. When we ask for, for, uh, God for forgiveness, we are supposed to accept that he has forgiven us. And for that matter, we shouldn't be carrying guilt around. There are some other stuff that we do. We have to go to the person to tell him what we did. But when, when I kill you, I do something really that affects you so much that when I come to you, you're going to kill me back. You pray to God, I think. Ask for forgiveness. And at the right time, there are so many pastors who did a lot of stuff. They didn't confess that moment. But when they said it during their preaching, wow, this man is a man of God. Do you think he couldn't have said it right after he did that? Mostly we are, in my point of view, we shouldn't send ourselves into so many problems. When you go to the teacher and tell him, you should wait the teacher. When some teachers, you tell him I cheated, that is that you get five, you fail. God doesn't want us to fail. And you didn't sin against him. You sinned against God. So that guilt we had is between us and God. So if I've asked for forgiveness, that God should forgive me, and I accept that he has forgiven me, and I'm not going to do that again, I think I'm okay, I'm done. But when I go to the teacher, tell him I cheated, and I get five, and I'm dropped, the next time I'll be tempted to cheat again to pass, and that time I won't go to the teacher again. That's my idea. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I don't know anyone else to, to add on to this before we move to the next question. Nobody else? Nobody? Um, I would like to say something based on what he said. Um, I hope I heard correctly. You mentioned there are consequences. God doesn't want us to have that he did not plan for. You said that? Okay. Um, the thing is, um, in this case, when we cheat, the consequence, of course, is not God who designed for them. It is us. So those consequences are not designed by God. So um, sometimes we will bear those consequences. Um, because they are consequences that God did not design. In fact, they follow what we have um, done. As a man uh, plans, so shall he, so shall he um, reap. There was something else you mentioned. Um, there was something else you mentioned. Maybe it will come back. Uh, anyways, we'll move on. What's the other question? Budisai, why did you go? Where is he? I'm here. 
Okay. Apart from prayer, how can I reach my family members who haven't realized the truth revealed in the Bible? Okay. I think this is a question uh, many of us ask. This question is under the assumption that I know the truth, right? Um, apart from prayer, how can I reach my family members who don't realize the truth? Meaning I have realized the truth, or I think I've realized the truth, and I think they haven't realized the truth. I think the first thing is how sure are you that what you say you've realized this truth is really truth? Are you with me? How sure are you that what you think is truth, that you think you've realized, is really true and that they don't know? Because there are times we are wrong, we think we are. Hello? We think we are right. Or there are times we are on the same boat. People just have a different sin than ours. Are you with me? We are equally wrong. We are doing wrong in another way. They are doing wrong in a visible way. And so the question is, first we really need to check if I am really right in this case. And then the second thing is Paul writing to Timothy says, watch your life. And by doing this you will save yourself and you will save others. Example, um, lifestyle. That is how, um, that is the best way by living out the gospel and um, lately we I don't know if you have noticed but there are many churches they are kind only when it comes excuse me the moment for evangelism have you noticed that they visit only when it's time it's the schedule of the church to have evangelism they give food to the community only when the time for evangelism in the calendar comes. And so it's not just about winning them, it's about allowing God to win us. Um, it's allowing God to win us, and through our lifestyle, through our conduct, God is going to, um, can at least point them to the light. And then we can also not change people we cannot transform people. We can be a means of God to inform someone, but we can never transform someone, and we can never tell them um, or push them to, to do something. That's what I would say concerning that. Who would like to ask? Or another question arises out of this. There's a microphone here, so if you have something to add, please come up front, or even if you have a question. We'll give one minute if you want to add because of time. And if you have a question, quickly come up. Yes. He has a loud voice. That's a good question. Um, this is why, because the person has not been clear, it's under the assumption that this person believes they know something better than the others. Or this person believes that on a specific issue, they are clearer than others. Um, we don't know what it is, but regardless of what it is, our lifestyle um, should be the best. And the way the question is structured, at the bottom the person says they are Adventist. So this is probably talking about uh, Adventist doctrine or Adventist lifestyle that the family is not living but he believes he or she that they are living it and they are not um, I think the first thing to do is how sure are you that the perception you have is the correct perception um, because you might have the wrong perception thinking they are wrong um, and so the best I would say is allow God to change you and through your example, through your lifestyle, maybe you are the one who needs change. So that, that's what I would say. Does that, uh, does that help? Any? Okay. Yes, Pastor.
Salamat po. I think we can go to the next one. We're running out of time. Just wait. Maybe if there's, uh, after we answer the, the other ones, we can come back. Just if you can write it or save it. Yeah. What's, what's the other one? Okay, I'll read it, then you can answer. This one and then this one? Oh, okay. Okay, I think this is a suggestion um, or a request. It goes like this. Oh, this is interesting. Very interesting. Quite interesting. Oh, it's there, huh? Does your ministry advise or enlighten about relationship and marriage? I'd appreciate if you hold a meeting for that soon. Sorry. That's wonderful. Budisai, uh, would you like to take this one? Uh, <laughs> that's quite a... Uh, <laughs> that's quite a... Uh, no, man. This is quite, this is quite uh, a really tough one. Uh, he's closer to marriage than me. So he's yeah, yeah, actually, of, of, of all the members in the ministry. I yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, actually, yeah, we, we, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I've quoted some uh, diplomatic executive advice, executive order, that I should not uh, uh, say some of these things. Right. Uh, okay, we are a ministry that is uh, run by young people, should I say. Uh, well, none of us are married yet. Uh, so we, we would love to have suggestions like what you've suggested, to talk about these issues, uh, talk about marriage and relationships. This is something that can be arranged, that we can get to, to have meetings and talk about this. Um, thank you for actually bringing that up. Uh, we may not have uh, very much experienced professionals in our ministry to actually, but maybe pretty soon we may have some to, to deal with this question. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Oh, oh okay, that's right, that's right. Um, <laughs> we, we have a series on family. It's entitled Home Controversy. Last Saturday, the other Saturday we were in Makati and we both presented on that. What, I'm not married. What I can do, what he can do, what we can do is present what the Bible does say. The theological, the practical, he will just call someone else. Elder Henry is there at the back. So when we do organize, we can, I can present the theological, he can present the theological. And Elder Henry will go into the practicality of things. But really, this is something that we are interested in. Thank you for the suggestion, and we are going to work on it. Thank you very, very. Was that you, Joshua, who asked this question? Why are you nodding like that? Okay. Okay, these are the questions that were written down. Uh, maybe we can take one or two before we go. Question or? Okay. You had your hand, right? You, you still have your question? No? Yeah, you can. We, we, okay. Pastor, go ahead. Pastor, Pastor Elias was first, I think. And then I saw a hand over there. Yes, uh, my question is um, related with the sermon you preached. Uh, by the way, before I'd like to congratulate the uh, IJA ministry, it's four years of ministry. God bless you all. And second, of course, you also. Please, marry first. Uh, um, Pastor Letter said for you to follow him. So, yeah, but my question is, um, we're talking about Jesus being incorruptible, right? Now, this week, somebody asked me a question, which also I'm asking for the sake of the congregation because we have dealt with that in one of our classes, Christian Beliefs class, but I think it's a question that many people might have. What was the nature of Jesus? Was that um, the nature of Adam before the fall? 
or after the fall? Now somebody asked me this question and this person said that on YouTube there are videos saying that um, Adventists are teaching, I won't say the teaching now, so, so that you won't be biased in answering your question. But this is the question I'm asking for the sake of the congregation. What is the nature of Jesus Christ? Because we're talking about Jesus incorruptible. His, his nature is before the fall or after the fall. Okay, that's... How, how should I say it? It's a simple question. It's, there are a lot of theological threads to it. But very simple. If you look at the Old Testament, um, the Old Testament taught that when you would go to the sanctuary, you needed to take a spotless lamb. And in John 1 29, when John saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the lamb of who takes away the sins of the. So Jesus, who is the lamb, had to be a spotless lamb. When you would go and offer a lamb in the sanctuary, it had to be a lamb that had no defect, a lamb that um, shouldn't be crippled, a lamb that was whole, um, pointing that the Savior of the world that would come, would come, as you saw in Ellen White's uh, quotations that I read also from Desire of Ages, um, that he had no uh, gall, he committed no wrong, and the Bible says... I wanted to quote the verse, but if I look for them, it'll take time. This is something I can post. I'll post it tonight. Um, he did no sin, and he committed no sin. For example, in Hebrews, it says, talking about Jesus, we have a high priest who does not need to offer sacrifices for himself, like the other high priests. What does this mean? You know that priests were converted, right? In the Old Testament. Priests were converted, but they had to offer sacrifices for their sins because conversion is not sinless perfection when you become converted it doesn't mean from that point on you become sinless there are still much we need to learn and there's still much we need to unlearn so we go throughout a process um, systematicians those who are into uh, systematic theology they've broken it down into three though those, it's not really divided into three, but it's just a way of explaining conversion. Uh, you have justification, sanctification, and glorification. So when you accept Christ, there's still things we need to learn and unlearn. So from that point on, we don't become sinless. When you go to 1 Corinthians 15, um, it says we will be changed in a twinkling of an eye when he shall appear. And then I believe it's 1 John 3, 2 that says, right now, we are the children of God. Right now, we are the children of God when we accept God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we do know that when He will appear, we will be like Him. We will be like Him, sinless, when He comes. And Paul says, when this incorruptible puts on incorruptibility. Actually, um, it's the verse. When this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, this perish shall put on an imperishable um, state. So what I've shown to you is that we humans are not sinless, but Jesus was sinless, and Jesus made no mistake. If he would have sinned, he would not be a perfect sacrifice for us. So Jesus committed no sin. Let's put that... Let, I know, I'm going there. I'm going there. Of Jesus. I'm going there. To go there... Wait, wait. To go there... We need to understand um, all of these things because actually these type of questions are questions not to be, okay, discussed where there's not enough time to break it down because it has implications. Every statement I make has implications. So hold on and give me some minute um, to leave you not further confused but to leave you with something because this has implications so I'm knocking them out first and we will get to the root of it. So Jesus committed no sin. Okay? And um, Jesus had... He, he did not struggle with sin from within, meaning Jesus was not a sinner. Is that clear? 
Because if he was, he would not be a perfect sacrifice. That's according to Scripture. Now, the nature of Adam before the fall and the nature of Adam, what? After the fall. Adam, of course, committed no sin. He was not infected with sin. Um, he did not have the bad thoughts. He did not last when he was in the Garden of Eden before sin. He did not have all of those things we have now. So clearly Adam's nature is different than ours. But Adam also did not get tired. Okay? Keep that in mind. He did not get tired. Now, after the fall, Adam sinned. Adam got tired. And that's the nature we have. Now, let's look at Jesus Christ. First of all, let us compare Jesus' nature and with the nature of Adam before the fall. Let us say here is Jesus and here is Adam. Okay. Adam came to the earth before the fall. Adam was physically perfect. Jesus came after the fall. Jesus was not physically perfect. Adam had committed no sin. Jesus started out also the same way Adam started out. Adam did not feel tired. Jesus did. Adam, before the fall, could not bleed. Jesus did. Okay? Adam did not experience hunger. Jesus did. Adam's nature is not the same with Jesus' nature. Are you with me? In this state, Jesus had weaknesses of the flesh. Adam did not have that. The one thing that Jesus had, that Adam, that Adam and Jesus had, was that they had no sin. They, they, had, they were perfect. But yet, Jesus took upon himself the weaknesses of humanity. What is that? He could feel hungry. If you cut him, he would bleed. If he walked for long, his feet would hurt. All of that. He would only become a sinner if he would make a wrong choice or if he would fall into temptation. And throughout his whole life, he didn't do that. And so when you look at the SDA Handbook of Theology, I forgot the page, I'll post it up tonight. Um, our standing, um, Seventh-day Adventist, is this. Jesus' nature is not exactly the nature of Adam before the fall. And Jesus' Adam, Jesus' nature, is not exactly after the fall also. Jesus has a unique nature. Why? I'm going to repeat this for the sake of us understanding. The term we are using um, as Adventists is that Jesus had a unique nature because it's true. Jesus' nature was not like Adam's. Jesus was tired, hungry. You could cut him, he would bleed. Adam didn't have all of that before the fall. Their nature is not the same. The, the similarity there or the likeness there is that they both um, started out without sin. Adam failed and became a sinner. Jesus did not fail and continued with the weakness of humanity. Now, us after the fall, we lust. Jesus did not lust after the fall. We steal. Jesus did not steal. We cheat. Jesus didn't cheat. Um, but however, we get hungry. Jesus did get hungry. Jesus groaned and said, I am sorrowful even unto death. And he was whipped and he bled. Um, so that he has, the weaknesses of humanity... And there's another term we use, another phrase, is this. Jesus was affected by sin, but not infected with sin. Are you with me? So he was not a sinner. He, he took upon himself the effects of sin, the weaknesses of a fallen nature. He took it upon himself. And he would have been infected if he would have sinned. Jesus' nature is not like Adam's. Jesus' nature is not like ours after the fall. Jesus had a unique nature. And that nature, um, it was not, um, how do I put this? He had the, the same divine help that is accessible to us today. This is why Jesus prayed and said, Father, Father, remove this cup from me. It was hard. It was painful. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he, he died on the cross. I hope... Um, that helps. The reason why I told you um, of sinless uh, state of humanity, even after conversion, is because when we read verses where it says that we must be like Jesus, we often think that it refers to the, the sinless perfection. We will have that 
when Jesus comes to take us to heaven. However, this is not an excuse to embrace our sinful nature. It is not, the fact that we are not sinless is not a passport to embrace the, sin, the sinful nature. We are to daily submit to God as He restores us by approaching Him, coming to His Word, meditating upon His Word. And this is why the Bible says, if you sin, when you sin, it's not go and sin, you have an advocate with the Father. If you sin, don't plan to sin. Don't, in, don't, don't draw a plan, I'll do this, I know cheating is wrong. It's what Rejoice was saying the other night. You study and you prepare and you won't have that thing of should I cheat or shouldn't I. Do all that you can to stay away from committing a sin. God will do that which you cannot do. He only asks us to do what we can do. I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Any other question arises out of this, we can take one more question that may arise out of this for the sake of time. Yes. Would you like a microphone? Can somebody help her? Here, give her this one. Um, my question is about God and free will. Okay. Um, earlier, I mean, during the message, mm -hmm. you mentioned, you said something like Mary had a choice to accept to carry Christ or not. Yes. And then when you said that, I just wondered, how is that possible? Because it's not like the angel came and said, hey, Mary, do you want to carry Jesus? No, but he came and said, Mary, you're going to carry Jesus. You gave him this name. This is what is going to happen. So it was more an FYI. The angel was telling her, you are going to. And so you said also that Mary was a teen, a teenager. And then if I look at a teenager and then you yeah. have this kind of information, the first thing you do is you analyze the situation who is giving you that message. And then as, let's say, I'm supposed to be married, and then I receive a message like that, first thing I will do is look at the person who is giving me the message. Is he older than me, more powerful? If yes, then, well, I just agree, okay, fine, I'll do what you want. But then if I look at the person giving the message, the person is my age or younger, then I say, hell no, I'm not doing that. So looking at that, I'm like, how is that possible that you said Mary had the free will to accept or carry Jesus? Like I said in the Bible, it doesn't say the angel came and asked Mary, do you want to carry Jesus? No, it was an FYI. And then it all comes out to us today, like when... I mean, there are two things in the world. It's either you're with God or you're not. And then it quest I question the free will. Like, if I don't do what God wants, then I'm supposed to be against him, which is maybe I'm, I don't want to be against him. I just sometimes don't want to do what he says. So where is it actually that the free will stands in okay. terms of humans and God? Thank you very much for that question. I think it's a good question. And I think it's maybe a question some of um, other people have in the congregation. So the question is on free will. Did Mary really have free will? It seemed like the angel just came to inform her for your information and came to tell her you've been chosen and you are going to bear this son. You know, one of the amazing things about Christianity and about the Bible um, and about God is that they are absolutes. They are absolutes. One of them is this. If we take the assumption of this question, it is that Mary didn't really have free will, that the angel forced. If we follow that, that implies that God is a God who doesn't respect free will. Are you with me? Are you with me? If we follow that logic, it's that God doesn't really have free will. And maybe it's that sometimes he offers, sometimes he doesn't. So what, the, sometimes questions, um, questions are a statement, for example. So this could mean only one thing, that God doesn't give free will, and God, if he doesn't give free will, he's not a good God. He's a bad God. But we already know that God is good. 
Are you with me? Are you with me? So that is an absolute truth. God is good. So as I try to perceive this and any other issue in the Bible, when I start to deviate into thoughts that challenges the character, the purity, the faithfulness, the trustworthiness of God, I am not headed in the right path, and that is not the correct logical conclusion. I must reason more um, into another path. Now, if, let's look at this textually. When the angel came, he greeted her and he said, you are blessed among women, blessed are you. And then the Bible says she was afraid. And she said, how can this be? And he said that um, this, is, this, this son is going to save the world. And Mary said, behold thy what? Thy what? Thy bond servant. And then Mary said, this is impossible. Mary is not saying here, I don't want to. She's saying, how can this happen? She's not saying, I don't want this to happen. I don't want to be the one through whom the Savior will come. She's just saying, how can it be? I'm a virgin. So she's not saying, I don't want it. She's saying, I'm a virgin. How can this be? And then she says, after he explains to her what Jesus will do, she says this, behold thy bond, what? Servant. This uh, reveals that it was her choice. She understood what it meant. She understood that this is a miracle. This is what's going to be through the Holy Spirit. And she's understanding the purpose. So she says, behold, thy what? Thy bond servant. And by doing this, she is giving permission for it to happen. One other thing um, is this. The Bible, for example, should I use heroin? Should I use heroin? As a Christian? Hello, should I use heroin? Where in the Bible does it say thou shall not use heroin? So I can use heroin. The Bible doesn't say I can't, so I can use heroin. Why don't we use it or anything alike? Follow this, follow this, stay with me. Because the Bible says my body is the temple of? God and heroin is harmful for my for my body there are verses in the Bible that do not prescribe but they are descriptive they describe an event and God speaks through the word sometimes he speaks directly and sometimes through implication when you are reading the fact that Mary said Behold thy bond servant, it implies that she accepted. Are you with me? Though you do not see a text in black and white, the Bible saying, And Mary answered and said, I give you my permission. You are not violating my free will. Go ahead with it. If the Bible were to do that for every topic, we would have a Bible this big. So through implication, the Bible reveals to us that Mary allowed it to happen. So textually, it's easily proven that she actually gave permission. And the other thing is this. If you say that God didn't give a free will, God is not a just God, God is not a fair God, God is not a bare God, and that is just absolutely not true. So that absolute of God's goodness, God's faithfulness, ought to keep us on the right track. Second, textually, it's there. It's very clear that um, she... Uh, allowed it and God did not break God did not force her free will um, if God even in the beginning did not break the free will of Lucifer who brought so much wickedness um, he restrained himself how much more for Mary in that um, situation I believe you had two questions I forgot the second one or does that cover okay I think it covers all of them because they're all linked No, I, that was, I think we've, we've run out of time. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, it's a blessing to see you here.
and it was a blessing to spend the Sabbath with you. Um, and I've been blessed, we have been blessed, and we pray that you have been blessed. Um, the world is headed in a path, um, because you raised the issue of free will, where we are no longer believing in absolute truths. That truth is becoming relative. Um, in fact, Time magazine some years ago, uh, on the cover of their page, they wrote, truth is dead. And actually it's being promoted. You know what was the word of the year in the Oxford Dictionary for 2016? Post-truth. You know what post-truth means? It means that truth comes second to preference. Or it comes second to what people like facts are no longer um, absolute. Preference comes before. Um, and this is, we are headed in a very uh, dangerous path. And as Christians, we have the moral law, and we have the Bible, and we have God and God's teaching as absolutes. Any philosophy, any idea that contradicts anything that the Bible is clear on, do not venture into that path. When you remove absolutes, that means there's no point of reference, there's nothing on the basis to differentiate between good and evil, um, and it's a path that we will pay uh, severely uh, in the future um, and well, you know when people say truth is dead uh, Ravi Zachariah has a very good answer for that uh, when you say truth is dead um, <laughs> it's a contradiction you know why when you say truth is dead you are making an absolute statement and truth is something which is absolute. Are you with me? So when I say truth is dead, I am making an absolute statement. I am making a truth absolute statement. If truth is dead, then the statement that truth is dead is not true. Are you with me? So when I say there are no absolutes, the statement of saying there are no absolutes contradicts when you say there's no absolutes. Are you with me? You get, you get the logic? So when you say truth is dead, you are making an absolute statement that truth is dead. Are you with me? You are making an absolute statement that truth is dead. And so uh, we, we have to be very careful. Before we pray, um, there's a member in a hijab ministry that is leaving December. Um, she's leaving us. We are going to miss her so much. And she has been a big help. She has been a great support. Um, she's the type of... You know, when I was preparing this sermon on the character of Christ, numerous times I was thinking of her. She's always cheerful. Sometimes we're, there's pressure. People don't come for the meeting. They don't give you an answer why they didn't come. They don't text you. Then they come late and they look at you like you have a problem. She is always patient. She's always smiling. Guys, don't forget to come. <laughs> so she's been really a blessing. And we are going to miss her. She's going to hate me for imitating her. But it's a mirror. Can you stand up? Please. Please. She's so humble. Can you come up front? We want to pray for you. She has really been a big support. And a big help. And before she leaves, we just want to thank her. And we want to pray for her. That wherever she goes, that God may bless her. Remember her in your prayers also. Thank you so much. And God bless you. Let me give you a hug. We are going to miss you. Wait, 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 wait. We are going to pray for her. And then we are going to have closing song and closing prayer for the event. Let us pray. Father, thank you for using Amira so much in this ministry. Thank you for her cheerful heart. Thank you for the joy that you have 
expressed to us through her. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for her humility. Thank you for everything that you have done through her. And thank you for what you have done with her character. When she came, she was not baptized, but she's living baptized. When she came, she was not really serving you, but now she's serving you. And Father in heaven, we give glory and honor to you. Because we know you have been with her, you have blessed her, and we know that like Joseph, like Daniel, wherever she goes, she will be successful because you are with her. Please, Lord, continue to bless her wherever she goes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Um, I think for the closing part of our program, we will stand um, and make a cycle, and we are going to sing the last song, and then we will have the, the closing prayer. So I want to request everyone to stand, and let us, let us hold the ends and uh, make a cycle around the chairs. Okay, um, I think we, we all know the song Side by Side We Stand. So we're going to sing side by side. I think most of us know the song i'll be just uh, reading the, the lyrics for the sake of those who don't know the song very well so we're gonna say side by side we stand awaiting god's command let's see side side we stand awaiting god's command. worshiping the saving king Living by His grace and moving on His faith. Jesus Himself will see us through. Meet me in heaven. We'll join hands together. Meet me by sides. Save your sight. I'll meet you in heaven. We'll sing songs together. Brothers and sisters will be there. Soldiers we are. We are all hard to go where Jesus leads. We'll fight in faith and will overcome heaven is our goal and saving every soul pray that we all will be there I'll meet you in heaven we'll join hands together Meet me by the Savior's side. I'll meet you in heaven. We'll sing songs together. 
Brothers and sisters, I'll be there. Let's sing once again the chorus. I'll meet you in, in heaven. Meet me by the Savior's side. I'll meet you in heaven. We'll sing songs together. We'll sing songs together. Brothers and sisters, I'll be there. Praise the Lord that we all be there. Father, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking in love and thank you for speaking the truth. Father, you have been faithful to us, but we many times have been unfaithful. Forgive us for the times we have neglected the truth and the times we've neglected to do what is right. But this day you have spoken to us in many ways and we want to rededicate ourselves to you, Lord. We want to commit our lives in your hands once again this evening. May you cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. May you give us a double portion of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will continually strive with us. I do not know the things that afflict everyone here, but you know. And perhaps as I pray, those things are brought into remembrance. Father, I pray that you will incline your ears to them and answer them in accordance to your will. Help us all to remain incorruptible through Jesus Christ. May you give us a blessed week. There are challenges awaiting us. Life goes on. But you have equipped us this day, this weekend, for the things that are about to come. Help us to remain in your word. Help us to pray before we sleep. Give us strength when we wake up in the morning to pray and to spend quality time with you in your word and to meditate upon your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a happy week. Thank you for coming.